Okay, we're on. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Joy. Hello. Um, thank you so much for doing this uh, for Keto Solution PEI. Um, I, we, we've had a couple of chats, and um, you know, this workshop that's coming up next Saturday has been a couple of years really in the making. Um, the team that I've put together here is really, um, they're great peer support. They're great, you know, to help people along with um, kind of the practical side of things. But um, I'm really excited to have you be on the consulting side and as a dietitian, um, very, very happy to have you uh, give us some of your expertise and, and uh, yeah, just really appreciate you doing this. Oh, I'm happy to do it. One coast to the other. <laughs> To the other, you, you, I, I don't want my uh, colleagues out here on the West Coast to hear me say this, but you've got the prettier deal. I, I'm originally from Montreal, and I spend uh, uh -huh. most summers in the Maritimes, both in Canada and the United States, and for sure, hands down, what they call ocean out here, it's like, there's no rocks, there's no waves, you go, and I went all the way to Tofino where the waves are, and I'm like, <laughs> Well, it is pretty in the summer, maybe not so much in January. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, we, we can go to the coast now and uh, sit outside in, you know, a short sleeve t-shirt. So. Yeah, we're not quite there. <laughs> it's <laughs> minus 20 some wind chill today. So we Ooh, have nasty. To up. Yeah, we do have to bundle up. Um, but so yeah, I just was wondering if uh, you could give us maybe a little bit of your background and, and your journey to low carb, how that all happened. Okay. Um, well, I... Uh, Studied dietetics and human nutrition at McGill in Montreal, which is where I'm from. And, uh, you know, classic uh, studies in the 70s were what they were teaching was this new diet with all this in increased amount of carbohydrate and reduced fat. And I was learning this was the new 1977 food guide. I still have the previous version. That's how long I've been around for. So I have a whole collection of them there. Um, and... So my teaching, like I had to relearn that, oh, no, this is carbs are, are good and fat is bad. And, and then all of this promotion with the new vegetable fats that were coming out, these polyunsaturated vegetable oil and healthy PUFAs and, you know, just indoctrinated. I mean, the, one of the blogs I wrote is about an article, a, a handout that I was given to me at McGill. It was produced by uh, Procter and Gamble about the fats that they were making, how we should sell them as you know promote them as dietitians. So it's kind of crazy when we look back at all that stuff. Oh, and I, I still have it. It's all yellow and whatever. I scanned it in and put it on one of my blogs because it, I, you know they were sell getting us to sell their products. It's just ridiculous. But you know, in, in hindsight, knowing what Harvard was doing with the sugar industry, paying their researchers to write about, you know, how fats were bad and sugar was good, not that, not that, uh, not that surprising. Yeah, so much influence. For sure. So my, um, I, w I practiced dietetics kind of uh, rather uh, routine. Uh, people came to me for all kinds of things. I ended up specializing in um, mental health nutrition because my three sons uh, have one of each subtype of ADHD. And so my research was in the area of ADHD and comorbid disorders, which includes just about everything from, you know, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, OCD, ODD, you know, the whole spectrum. So I had to learn about all of that and, you know, neurotransmitters. So I um, practiced a lot in that area, helping people with diet and, um, you know, and mood. Um, and then as a result of my becoming diagnosed, being diagnosed with anaphylactic food allergies, I ended up specializing in a second area in food sensitivity and food allergies. So it didn't matter that I was overweight when I had my twins, became obese after my third child, which was 14 months later. Okay. and stayed obese for 25 years because I wasn't predominantly working in weight loss. Uh, I had people that saw me occasionally for, you know, wanting to lose weight, but that wasn't by any means the bulk of my practice. Most of it was mental health, nutrition, and food allergy, and food sensitivity, and being fat had no bearing on it whatsoever. But um, in 20... 
2015, a girlfriend of mine, who's a retired physician from uh, Indonesia, came to see me because she wanted to implement a low-carb diet for her husband, who had diabetes and heart disease and various other predispositions, and wanted to know what I thought of a low-carb diet. Well, I remember Atkins when Atkins was new, which is a while ago, and so it was like, oh, the Atkins diet. And she went, well, it's kind of a little different now. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know about the resurgence of, you know, I didn't know Dr. Westman wrote an, a, a, a revised version of, of the Atkins book. <laughs> so he had been reading Dr. Jason Fung, and uh, she's Chinese background, and she just thought he was brilliant, and she was said, read some of his blogs and let me know what you think. Well, she didn't tell me at that point he had written a year and a half's worth of blogs. <laughs> so I started reading them and I read through them and I found them very interesting because he always had the embedded studies. So you could click on the study, whatever he said, he did, rather than just putting a reference, he actually had a link right to the study. So being a nerd that I am, I'd read the study. And I think it took me about six weeks and I had read about halfway through all of his blogs and I was reading like two hours a night. And I finally said to my girlfriend, uh, how many has he written? Oh, about a year and a half's worth. I said, well, I, I can't read all of them, um, but I've got enough here that I realize uh, my practice is going to change. I can't keep doing what I'm doing. And I actually mm -hmm. reached out and contacted him. And he was, this was before he wrote even his first book. He was writing his first book at that point, so he had more time. And he was very helpful to engage with me in discussion about macros and, and how to you know, set macros and what distribution, how much protein, how much fat, um, some of the parameters that affect those. And then a little bit on intermittent fasting, which he, he wasn't, I think, as focusing as much on at that point. Uh, so I picked his brain, and then if something I didn't know something, I could send him an email, and he was very gracious to respond. And then I was able to go through his uh, IDM training with Megan when it first opened. He said, oh, you can just sit in on it so you can see what we teach people. So I got to go through the whole training, you know, at no cost. Nice. And, and get a, a sense of how they do things. But being a dietitian, I had some reservations about some of the approaches without having a lot of background on you know safety e efficacy like long-term fasting for example or very you know using 80 percent fat diet and and lower protein especially in a you know postmenopausal women for example who are predisposed to sarcopenia and you know muscle deterioration as they age so I had some, I had a slightly different approach just because I was a dietitian. So I figured, well, that's not bad. You can, you can take the good things that someone does and then just kind of modify it and make it your own. So I started reading at that point, um, Eric Westman and listening to some of his lectures. And as the handout that I gave you, actually, you'll see some of the things in there. And I, when I heard him speak in Vancouver, I brought my pamphlet and I said, by the way, this got in my pamphlet. Does it look familiar? And he said, yeah, I, I just kind of made that up on the fly when I started and it stuck. <laughs> and he says, it, it, it actually really works, but I just kind of made it up as arbitrary. I had to set limits on things like how much sour cream or how many olives. I said, how'd you come up with six olives? I had no idea. But it, it, if people eat like eight or ten olives, it's problematic because then they displace other things in their diet. So he, he impacted my view, uh, Dr. Ted Naiman did as well. I listened to quite a few of his um, talks. So my view evolved. Um, I started to practice it in my, my own practice. I, took, I had clients at that point who came to me for weight loss and I said, I need to take about six weeks off to rethink how I'm gonna do meal plans because they're not gonna be the same. I can either give you your money back <laughs> <laughs> or you can wait until I, and they all, uh, they all wanted to stick with, with it and do it this new way. It ended up being three months off and they were fine waiting uh, because I wanted to, I had to rethink how I was going to distribute things and it, and it had to be evidence-based. So by the time I got started, I had three women who had been waiting three months for me to do their meal plans. And one of them is still follows me on Facebook 
and she's still slim. And Perfect every time I post something, she'll like like it and go like this. And I'm and I'll see her pictures. Like at first, she'd send me pictures on on her vacations and stuff. And I'd go, wow, she 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 did what I taught her, and and look, and she's still slim. She's still doing it, and she's been one of my cheerleaders as I done it myself. So the story of how I ended up doing it myself was uh, 22 months ago, uh, actually in two days, it'll be 22 months. Wow. And it, it's that significant, you know, when people go through a religious experience, they say, what day did you get converted to fill in the blank, whatever the religion is. And, you know, you've got that, that's the day you got whatever, dunked, sprinkled, whatever, I don't know how it works. Yeah. Um, but my transformation to becoming low carb myself was that kind of a, I was going one way and then I totally changed where I was going. I was sitting at my desk, this desk, and I just didn't feel good. I didn't know what was wrong. I just knew I really felt unwell. So I have my clinic is in a section of my house. I went upstairs where I have a, a, a blood pressure cuff, which I hadn't used in two years, and, but it was faithfully on my other night table and I put, put it on and took my blood pressure and it was 199 over 100. Ooh. And I went, that can't be right. So I lay down on the bed for 15 minutes and I took it again. It was like 187 over 96 or something like that. And I was like, oh dear. If I go to my doctor, he's been threatening to put me on statins for like a donkey's age. And he wanted to put me on metformin. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going in on any of that. I took my blood sugar. Uh, it was about two hours, maybe an hour and a half after I'd eaten. And it was 13.1 or two. And I was like, if I go to the doctor now, he's going to send me in a cab to the hospital. And I'm going to get an IV and come home on four or five pints of medication, which I probably should have done in hindsight because I was a ticking time bomb. Yeah. But I had two girlfriends drop dead within three months of each other just a few months before this day. Mm. One died of a heart attack in her house. One of them I went to high school with and the other one I knew when I was in university. One was a nurse and one was a care aide. So they were both in healthcare. One died of a massive stroke and one died of a heart attack. So one common. died, um, she retired on the Friday and Monday she was dead. The other one was discovered by her daughter in her house after having a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I realized if I didn't change what I was doing, I was going to be a similar statistic. It was just a question of when. So that day I, impl I started implementing what I had been teaching my clients to do for about two years. And I have not looked back. I've lost almost 50 pounds. I've lost 12 inches off my waist. Fantastic. 12 inches. <laughs> like, how do you, I, I remember when I measured my waist initially and, and I know, you know, waist to height ratio and I was going, I have to lose a foot. How am I going to lose a foot? I thought that was like, that's impossible. Well, I figured I don't have to lose a foot now. I only have to lose a half an inch at a time. So just keep doing it. Keep doing it. And I've lost six inches off my neck, four inches off each arm, four inches off each thigh. And I'm like, it's just happened. I just stuck okay. with it. And I have um, put my type 2 diabetes into reversal, into oh, remission. Yeah. Remission is the term that I use because if I eat the carbs again, I am going to be diabetic again. It's, I'm not exactly. cured. Um, and I, I actually went to my physician today. I needed to get a, a prescription renewed and I showed him the picture that I posted the other day, uh, the, the combo. And he goes, I remember when you look like that. And he's going, wow, how much did you lose? I said, 50 pounds. And he goes, wow, yeah. Okay, and he, he wasn't supportive of what I was doing from the beginning. He was very skeptical. And then he insisted recently that I go see an endocrinologist because he couldn't, definitely couldn't give me metformin because my blood sugar was below 6.0. And I'm like, 6.0 is not good. 
it's, this is not good. And after I've lost all the weight, he would not give me the metformin. So today he asked me, he says, are you on metformin? I said, yep, Dr. So-and-so has given me four times a day. But your blood sugar was four, your hemoglobin A1C was 6.0. She said, yeah, she realized that's really lousy. She yeah, wants it is. better than that. She that's wants a mindset it. we have to change. Hmm? That's a mindset we have to change. And then he kind of looked at me and goes, well, she's the expert. Uh, we'll just go with what she said. And so he won't manage those, uh, the uh, metformin anymore. He says, you need to keep seeing her because I, I couldn't give you that dose because I have no idea why she's doing it. I said, my father was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. That's one reason. There's you know, heart disease in the family. You know, I'm diabetic. My whole family's diabetic, you know, and I listed the different thing. And, but he doesn't understand the diff how hyperinsulinemia is a precursor to all these other diseases. He doesn't see the relationship between like high blood pressure and diabetes. Right. He thinks the high blood pressure is from eating too much salt. And he, he doesn't understand the potassium bit. You just you need to eat more vegetables and less salt. No, you need to eat less carbs. It doesn't matter about the salt and it doesn't matter about the potassium. Well, the potassium helps, but you know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's actually a good segue into, uh, you know, the whole nutrition part of it. You know, people get kind of confused, like, where do I start? How do I get, you know, how do I make sure that I'm not missing out on something? Or how do I know I'm getting, you know, all the micronutrients I need and electrolytes and things like that? Well, um, I think we, what we have to do before we can even answer that question is, is discuss the fact that there are different ways to do low carb. There are different low carb low carb diets, and there are different ketogenic diets. And on my my web page, uh, which I'll do a plug for, it's it's actually absolutely you, you have the the handout, but it's the low carb healthy fat dietitian. So it's lchf hyphen rd for registered dietitian dot com. And we'll definitely the be sharing that. Thought tab is a whole is a, a 125 articles that are all referenced and but in plain simple English, so anybody can understand them. Um, and so there's a few articles where I explain the different types of low carb diets and the different types of ketogenic diets. Um, so if I'm going to put it in terms of types, there's the, and, and that's how I did it on my webpage originally, is there's a Dr. Fung approach to a low carb diet, which is a high fat, moderately low carb, uh, low protein, very low carb diet. So you have average protein, very, very high fat. So it's like 75 to 80% fat and, you know, 20% protein and five to 10% carbs. And those slide around a bit depending on who's doing it. Then there's the Ted Naiman approach, which is much higher protein. The fat that comes with the protein you're eating and which is quite similar to what uh, Dr. Stephen Finney and Jeff Olek do with Herda. And I ended up going from starting with Dr. Fung's approach to really very similar to Dr. Westman, Dr. Naiman, and uh, Stephen Finney and Jeff Olek. Higher protein, the fat that comes with the protein you're eating. No, no, there's no fat bombs. There's no pouring, you know, cream on everything and butter on everything and bacon fat and everything. Because what I realized after, I, I mean, I did this with my, my own clients for two years before I did it people who were following that approach weren't losing weight or some of them were gaining weight. Like people who, I won't mention the well-known webpage that people get diets off of, but I have probably a third of my clients come to me is I'm following the keto diet on XYZ webpage yeah. and I've gained 15 pounds. What am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. And what they're usually doing wrong is they're eating too much fat and not enough protein. Uh, it works. That approach works great for young men. Athletic young men. Men can get away with a lot more than women can. There's more. Yeah. And if they're athletic, they can get away with murder. That's right, they can. But postmenopausal women should not be doing this because they're, they're, they've got the hormone thing and they've got the, the estrogen, you know, the, the, body, the um, body fat storing, you know, these hormones and, and just interfering with this whole process, so. I, I take different approaches for different people. Um, so I, I would put them, that's kind of the, the other approach. And then there's people who are like the carnivore, like all meat, 
no, no, no plant protein at all. No, you know, and they will say, oh, don't eat those things. They're, they're, they're bad for you because they've got, you know, anti-nutrients. They do have anti-nutrients. I know they, they have oxalates and phytates and interferes with the binding of certain nutrients. But you need to know when to eat them, when not to eat them. And, exactly. But they also have a lot of things that we need. So I, I believe, that's my opinion, uh, based on the studies that I've read and the people that I've, you know, listened to that are knowledgeable. And uh, there are people who I really respect who have, you know, doing this carnivore thing because they think it's great. I, I'm really, I'm really wondering about the carnivore thing. I really can't figure it out if it's good or bad. I, the people that are doing it seem to be doing well, but I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's the long-term micronutrient thing um, right. that we don't know about. Where you know, they say, oh well, if you eat, if you eat your, your fish raw like sushi, you'll get enough vitamin C. And you know, from one point of view, we don't know what the requirements are of the human body for people who eat low carb altogether. The DRIs, exactly. I can't go to the DRIs and say, how much calcium do I need? Because, you know, if, if I was eating lots of grain with lots of lectins and phytates and, and oxalates, I'm going to have a whole bunch of things that are going to interfere with my calcium absorption. But if I'm not eating those things, and if I didn't eat nuts, which I do, but if I didn't eat nuts, which interfere with them, then I, the amount that I would need to eat of calcium to get adequate calcium would be sufficient, significantly less than someone who eats a standard American or standard Canadian diet. So we don't even know what our requirements are. People who eat, you know, anywhere between a Dr. Fung approach and a, you know, uh, Verda Health approach, somewhere in there, you know, from... Uh, That's kind of what I tell people too. Like, it's hard to know. There's no, there's not a lot of us that are included in studies. <laughs> there, there isn't. So what I do is I, I send people for blood work. I don't see anyone unless I see blood work. And uh, you can tell an awful lot by, you know, doing a, an, a um, clinical evaluation and looking at blood work. And if I'm, after taking their dietary intake and finding out what they've been eating up until that point, if I'm concerned that they're compromised in, in micronutrients, then we'll test them and we'll make sure that, I mean, there's lots of, of low carb things that people can get. Like one of the things that's on everybody's meal plan is cheese, hard cheese, because it's a good source of calcium and it's a good protein source. Not more than four ounces, according to, to uh, uh, Dr. Westman. So four ounces it is, that's the max, unless you're having fondue and it's a special treat. Um, but it works, it works. I haven't had a client that making this kind of individual adjustment for hasn't worked. And everybody's on a slightly different approach. That some of them have more protein, some of them have less protein, some of them, some of them. I have people that are doing incredibly well on 130 grams of carbohydrate. If they're not <laughs> diabetic or they're just pre-diabetic, some of them do incredibly well. Mm -hmm. It's all individual. I, I'm jealous. Because I can, I'm, I'm actually the lowest, the most restricted carbs of any of my clients. I can't eat more than 25 grams of carbs in a day. Yeah. And most of my clients can eat 100 to 130. And then there's people who need less. And I have people at, from every range from, I have a few people who choose to eat the same level as I do, but don't have to. To people who we start them higher, and and if there's a clinical need, we lower them down. Yep, it's, it's all individual approach, and what people, what kind of change they can handle, and lifestyle, yeah. and you know, culture all that. has a big thing to do with it. Like you know, if they're South Asian or or, or yeah. um, Asian, and they're big rice eaters, I can't just say you can't ever have rice again. And look, cauliflower rice not going to cut it. Yeah. So it's what kind of rice, how much rice, and, and, you know, working within the parameters of the multicultural environment that, you know. That's one of the most challenging for us as well, is the yeah. South Asian, yeah. But people, because the, a lot, the, the diabetes is so rampant in the South Asian community, and a lot of the people are tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside, they get it. They understand there's something going on in their community that people who don't look fat are all getting diabetes and heart disease. So they're, 
the people who have it in their family are usually much more uh, receptive to making those kind of adjustments. But you can't take away. I mean, I, I invented low carb roti for my South Asian clients, and they will love it. Really, yeah. it's on my webpage under recipes. Cool. I'll be looking that up. Okay. <laughs> and it can be easily adapted for the uh, to make it tortillas just by switching one of the ingredients, adding a little more psyllium husk, uh, which gives nice. it the grainy texture and uh, less gargum, which is the thing that holds it together. Just changing it that way, I've got a couple of uh, Hispanic clients who think, oh, you invented tortillas. I'm so happy. Nice. Well, they're really roti, but you just change this and it's like a tortilla. That's and that's the thing adapting uh, recipes and getting to that point where you can make things that are more familiar it makes it so much more sustainable and so that's the way it has to be sustainable I mean yeah. it, the recipes I post are ones I invent for myself because I, I got fat being a foodie and I'm getting slim being a foodie and now I can share my recipes with other people like that's fantastic that's why I take pictures and postings. If people on social media go, oh, I love this recipe, are you going to post it? Then I have to write it up and post it. If people go, that looks good, but they don't like make a big deal about it, then I'm not going to bother. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Our group is great for that. They post so many great recipes and things they've come up with on their own. And That's awesome. Um, yeah, it is. It's great. But there's lots great. of different, to summarize, there's lots of different ways to low carb. There's lots of different ways to keto. And everybody's uh, individual nutrient needs are different, depends on their age, their yeah. gender, their stage of life, whether they, they've had kids, whether they're breastfeeding or, or pregnant, whether they're male, female, whether they are athletic, whether they're, you know, sedentary. There's no one size fits all. Absolutely. That's, that's the bottom line. No one yeah. size fits all, for sure. Um, so another question, where do you see the future of therapeutic nutrition with other disciplines, you know, in the health and healthcare field. As in which disciplines? Well, well, in our group, for example, in our national group, we have, well, I'm a pharmacist and I'm very interested. We've got um, physicians, nurses, LPNs, um, even physios. Yeah. We've got some chiropractors, you know, it's, um, it's kind of, it's got a broad um, appeal. <laughs> Well, I think as clinicians in different areas are um, open to it and begin to um, educate themselves and share it with their clients, perfect example, I don't recall in our group, uh, in the Canadian group, anyone, a dentist in our, in our group that I know ah, of. That's a good I point. know there's a dentist in the States that writes, a Chinese dentist that writes a lot about low carb and dental health. But I went to my dentist last year and he said, wow, did you ever lose weight? And that was like, I had only lost like 32 pounds at that point. Wait till he sees me like next month. Um, and I started talking to him about low carb and he says, oh, if my, my patients went low carb, I would have like way less fillings and, you know, the sure. dental cleaning would be like half the amount of time. The last time I went for a dental cleaning, it was like, instead of an hour, it was like 20 minutes because there's nothing sticks to your teeth if you're not eating like. Yep. <laughs> and that's a surprise. It's like, whoa, I didn't expect that to happen. Yeah. So it, it affects everything. And I think as we as individual clinicians share with other people how it impacts health. Um, and I, I'm kind of like an evangelist that way. I, you know, I went to see my doctor today, talked to him about low carb, go to see my endocrinologist, <laughs> talk to him about low carb, go see my dentist because I talk about it all the time too. You're, you're the same way. Because I, I think if it wasn't for my girlfriend who came to see me about her husband and, and she's a retired physician, if somebody else had said to me, oh, I'm doing a low carb diet, I'd roll my eyes and go, whatever, you know, good luck to you. Good but luck. Somebody who's very well educated, who is a physician. And so I couldn't just blow her off that easily. I had to consider what she had to say. And then I realized that we as clinicians are in that position of influence. And so um, the, the blog I wrote today is just about um, the two doctors that interviewed me on the podcast and me, the two docs and a dietitian I referred to. And, I like it. and, and how, and I referred to the uh, Canadian clinicians for therapeutic um, nutrition there saying, you know, there's 1500 people who are from all different backgrounds who are all, you know, interested in how it impacts uh, their uh, take on on healthcare. So I think as we, as a as a group, as 
as, a, as practitioners help other practitioners understand the use of it. That's where it's going to grow because our use in, with individuals is great. It's exciting. It's wonderful to see people lose weight, reverse their type, you know, put their type 2 diabetes into remission, you know, get off all, all kinds of medication for cholesterol and hypertension and everything else. But where I, the big, for me, the big um, reward is, get, is getting another um, clinician on board or having an effect on another clinician because they can impact a couple of hundred people each. That's right. Once they see one patient, get good results. I think my doctor today is kind of, and he's ready to retire soon, but now he's kind of like, huh, I'm trying to get back in shape. I said, well, I, I would recommend looking at a lower carb approach. He goes, okay. And you could see, like, instead of just blowing me off after seeing me having lost 50 pounds and getting off all the medications, he's kind of like, and I got a master's degree. I'm not like, you know, yeah. it's in his books. <laughs> he's kind of like, hmm. Well, and he didn't say maybe, but you could see like his, his reaction to the talk that I had with him yep. was different this time. Well, he might at least go and try to learn more about it, right? Well, he has my cards. He can look at the webpage. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So yeah, that's maybe that's where we'll lead into next. So where, where can people get in touch with you or learn more about you, what you do? And Well, um, the uh, Low Carb Healthy Fat Dietitian is the name of my division. And it's LCHF hyphen RD, which is registered dietitian.com. So LCHF hyphen RD.com. And if you just put Joy Kitty, which is my name spelled K I D D I E, into Google, you'll get one of my two practices either BBD Nutrition, which is my original practice, which I've been in business in BC for about 15 years, and then the low carb high fat or low carb healthy fat dietitian. Um, so. You're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're... I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I spend far too much time on social media, but... Um, post it's a blessing article. and a curse. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing and a curse. It is, but this is where people get to ask me questions and um, I get to engage with the people who take the time to read what I write. I mean, if I, if I write these articles and 1,500 people... I mean, the, the article I wrote about... Um, which one was it? One of the articles I went got 14,000 hits. Oh, wow. 14,000. Uh, one of the Google um, journalists posted it. And I was there like, goes, what? <laughs> so, yeah. And you just don't know who you're going to hit or who you're going to influence or who's going to see. You know? Yeah. And then you get the emails, like 15 or 20 emails after, after a podcast or after a post. And, and people say, how can you help me? Do you, you know, and I do distance consultations. So just like we're talking now, I, this, people can be in my office and I do the exact same evaluation with people via Skype, via telephone. I mean, some of the older generation don't want to be seen on Skype. They'd rather do long distance. I do long distance. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Well, we'll definitely be, be sharing that info with the group. So. Okay. And we're happy to have you in the group. And thank you so much for doing this with us. You're very uh, welcome. Really appreciate it. All right, and we'll be in touch soon. Okay. All right.